Good morning, good morning, morning, good morning, morning. Good morning, viewers, and welcome back to the Tobago Updates Morning Show. Coming to you here live from the Port Mall in Scarborough, Tobago. It's the Monday before Christmas. In fact, it's that one week Kong Dong uh, to the Christmas celebration for 2023. And just before we head on into this first interview, shout outs this morning to Selma Lashley, uh, Portia John Charles, and Desmond Denzu. And in fact, Desmond is watching us live from Cape Coast in Ghana. Good morning to you and welcome, Lisa James, and all others out there. Good morning to each and every one of you and welcome to the Tobago Updates Morning Show. At this point, viewers, we're heading on into our first interview this morning with Barrington Kippy Thomas, and we're speaking the THA administration two years later. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. All right, I suspect there might be some uh, technical challenges there. Are you hearing us, Barrington Skippy Thomas? All right, no, I suspect he's not hearing us uh, just yet. So we'll try to uh, uh, ensure that we correct that connection accordingly. Uh, but most certainly, we want to also shout out this morning, Otis Nixon uh, in the mix. Adana, what, what, what is on your lineup for, for this week? Let's, let's just drop that in very quickly there. Well, I know we can't take the whole week. <laughs> But what's one of those key things that you're hoping one to, of the key to be things, able to achieve you know, this you week? You know, the last minute cleaning up and packing back and getting stuff ready and, you know, getting the house looking spruced up. Yes, that yes. definitely is on high up on the list. So that might happen today as we speak. It might probably be ongoing at the moment. And I, when I get there, I'll continue. But that is really high up on the list. I also have a few activities to attend this week on Thursday. Um, some youths from uh, my church, Victory Outreach Church, the Victorious Generation of Destiny, they are hosting a Christmas village. Nice. Right, they're hosting a Christmas village as an outreach um, program where they're going to go into the communities and the community of Sangster Hill, that is, and um, just reach the community there. And of course, they're going to have their vending booths um, during the day and um, um, entertainment, parang music, giveaways, and stuff like that. So that's one of the primary things I'm doing as well this week because I'm one of the coordinators yes. as one of the leaders in our church. So that is high up on my list as well. And of course, you know, just passing by my auntie and see what's going on there, you know. <laughs> See if how far the ham is, if ham done bake, the bread done bake, you know, just walking around and checking to see what's happening, what's happening in the homes of other people as well this weekend, of course. A trip to the botanics. <laughs> yes, I yes. Ensure and ensure ensure that you have that uh, definitely uh, in right. the lineup and That's taking right. place. Uh, you know, again, folks, uh, you will have your activities uh, lined up for this week most definitely. I saw in the news, interesting enough, um, well, not very much of a surprise for me. Uh, the business chamber indicating, uh, you know, that um, the the business is indicating that the sales, yes. as anticipated, is not, not necessarily as high. I wonder if it's really the wait for this week as the final rush and the push to get it all done or whether or not it is a genuine situation and circumstance that we just don't have yeah. we just don't have the excesses that we enjoyed in years gone by and therefore we are forced to reduce uh, what might be that normal kind of spending i, yes. I don't know do you think uh, it's, we're going to have that last minute I, rush I, this week I, well i know for certain that i still have to do some last minute rush mm -hmm. so i might be one of those in the last minute rush but i don't know what percentage of last minute rushes we would have and how it would affect or impact the um the, the, the status quo right now in terms of the sales the anticipated sales and what is happening i'm not sure i really I, i'm still kind of trying to assess the situation because i mean i mean i go out there and i see people shopping yes. but i mean i suppose from their perspective they will have statistics and they'll be able to make um you know references in terms of last year and previous years so i don't know what is happening there let's see let's see what will happen this week we have until let's say friday saturday even sunday to do some shopping so let's see how it turns out um by then hopefully people are able to go out and get the stuff I, I, unless people are shopping online i don't know yes. if mm -hmm. they are shopping online and talking about shopping online there are wars because i hear people are talking about oh my gosh my package can't reach on time or you know customs or whatever it, it, the case is um, um, the online woes are also there. So I'm hoping that people will be able to go out shop, get the stuff they need, you know, especially the toys for the children, you know, <laughs> on Christmas Day. So here's to hoping the situation improves. And I really hope it's not that we don't have, because I really like to know that people have 
you know so let's see how it goes let's see how it goes yes and also want to send some commendations out there the lighting and happenings weren't only taking place uh, here uh, in Scarborough, but it also took place up at Roxborough Hospital. Uh, as far as we can see, based on our updates, the tree lighting uh, that took place as of, uh, up at Roxborough. And again, uh, commendations. Uh, most certainly we saw coming together there um, of officials, management and staff of the Roxborough Health Facility. And you know, it's, it's, it's particularly uh, commendable uh, for the fact that this is a, a relatively new space and by new I, I mean it was built for some time and then eventually mm -hmm. operationalized mm -hmm. but more importantly now um, there's a usage of this piece and therefore seeing the need to take that time out in the mix uh, you know the very vibrant medical chief of staff uh, up on that end Dr. Nathaniel That's Duke right. <laughs> um, Dr. Faith B. Israel Deputy Chief Second Secretary with Responsibility and the entire team certainly again commendations in the mix of the profession still bringing that Christmas spirit and you know I really look forward to seeing seeing that uh, throughout uh, some of those spaces with essential services. Uh, for the simple fact, whether it's the hospital or, or wherever you may be, for those who have no choice but to spend the season there because of their health circumstances, we still want them to have that spirit and that feel of Christmas. And I'm certain that they will look forward to that um, coming together with those members of staff. That's right. I was uh, who will to also see. be spending their yeah. time, you know, uh, as essential workers uh, in the service. So again, we want to say kudos and commendations going out there to our healthcare workers and, you know, those in our armed forces and so on that continue to deliver service and, and to give the very best even on christmas day they give up being with their families to ensure that they continue uh, to provide and so that our services do not shut down altogether so commendations we're shouting out this morning all those essential workers that continue to be on the outside whether it's christmas day new year's day whatsoever the season they are on the outside all right viewers at this point we have uh, back with us uh, to head into our first interview this morning barrington skippy thomas joining us online let's see if we uh better off now with the connection good morning to you sir hi good morning good morning excellent so we, we're hearing you loud and clear uh, at the moment yes welcome and uh, you know this morning you you you're, you're sitting on the other side and by that i simply mean a political activist and we know you are usually hosting here <laughs> at to be yes. updates but yes. giving your perspective now uh from that uh you know of of, of the interviewee on the other end as we get the conversation started uh, you know we want to get that general perspective in the in in the first instance uh, what would you say if you have to define it in one state statement will your hopes and aspirations or expectations of a new administration coming into office uh, after what would have been a period of leadership by the former administration well there are some very low-hanging fruits and it would seem to me that those low-hanging fruits ought to have been achieved um, um what are the measurables I think two years after, generally, the feeling is that nobody knows. All right. So therefore, we, we, we diving straight on in. It is two years into this current uh, administration. We would have seen uh, what we can broadly define as the assignment of the relevant portfolios. Let's start there. Based on the skill sets that exist within, uh, what's your assessment of uh, the individuals that have been assigned in the respective areas to collectively drive this mandate uh, led by Chief Secretary, the Honorable Fali Chavez Agustin? Well, my thoughts on the skill set generally is that in the for matters of politics, um, what is uh, for matters of politics, what is really required is that people have voted. So it would seem to me that the skill set for driving administrations is really that of the technocrats and the politicians lead by policy. I don't know, but I move around very often and people speak to me and there seems to be some a, le a level of dissatisfaction. I don't think it's because of the skill set of the politicians. I rather suspect it might be related to the support of the technocrats, but for whatever reason best known to them, um, generally people seem to be dissatisfied. That is what they are telling me. What are some of the things you are hearing as a definite highlights, at least one or two, 
uh, that uh, as you identify that there's dissatisfaction with out there? People are not of the view that their quality of lives are better two years after. You mentioned that the politicians lead by policy. In your opinion, have you seen that leadership guided by policy um, from the politicians? Well, I'm hearing it. I'm hearing the policies. Um, I'm really not seeing the rollout. So surely there's a problem somewhere. Uh, Baron and Skippy Thomas, would you say that they have underestimated somewhat the circumstances? Now, this administration came in uh, on the mantra of let me fix this um, in terms of identifying many concerns and issues uh, far and wide in Tobago, which certainly the Tobago population agreed with. Uh, would you say that uh, certainly that it may have been a case of underestimating the extent of the challenges? Or would you say that two years, ultimately, um, one can only do so much to try to correct some of the issues? What's your perspective? This administration is faced with the Herculean task of familiarity, one. Obstruction is two. But, and persons, three, who are so entrenched in the system, right there in Tobago, that those persons who are entrenched in the system have not been able to distinguish the fact that this is a new administration. So there seem to be some obstruction. But if there are obstructions, and those obstructions are preventing or harassing the rollout of the Executive Council's policy, then those things can be remedied and very simple. And I suspect they're not being remedied because um, if I have to borrow the quotation of what many people said to me, perhaps the secretaries are not insisting on their policies after the obstruction and so, because might be really a group of Bishopians leading in policy and a group of Bishopians executing as the technocrats. So maybe the familiarity between the politicians and the technocrats is what is haunting them and causing the disquiet as it exists two years after. What would you therefore identify as some of the tough decisions that needs to be made at this point? They are midway in the term, uh, two years have gone, and on paper we say two years left, but in politics you know ultimately it's not two years given that you go into that uh, election mode, not two full years I should yes. say. Uh, what would you say at this point are some of the critical changes that need to be made in order to give that clear signal or to make that change so as to continue to uh, positively impact uh, Tobago so that Tobago benefits? While it is not for me to advise a chief secretary, but in so far as you have asked the question, the chief secretary need to run his executive by giving very clear instructions to his secretaries regarding rollout of projects and policies and programs and so, and set timelines. And I don't want to use the term punish, but set timelines and hold the secretaries accountable to the timelines he upset. It's two years after, two years later, in all fairness and assessment wise, do you think that two years is sufficient to make um, demarcation as to the progress? Having, consider, having considering all the challenges or, or whatever was left for them to fix it, um, coming to where we are now, is two years a sufficient time and is even four years sufficient? And as um, Julian mentioned earlier, it's not a full four years because you go into that campaign mode before yes. you complete your four years. So essentially, you have just about three and something years to do what you have set out to do. Is it sufficient time to, you know, correct the things and then to implement your policies, your programs, your initiatives that would bring the level of change that we're hoping for, especially as a new administration? Well, if we have to use some international benchmarks, the Singaporean model with um, Lee Kuan Yew, um, the Canadian model with Justin Trudeau, um, my answer to that is yes, because let me put it this way also. It was the politicians who set the timeline for the people during the election. Okay, I accept that 
being on the other side of the fence during the campaign, they may not understand the reality of what the challenges are. But you see that vote, that election day, is a contract between the people and the politicians. And when you set policies, when you set policies from the platform, the expectation of the people are going to be very high. And it will not be an excuse politically to say we only have three and a half years to perform. And that's the reality of the politics. And this executive council has an advantage by having a very large control over the assembly. So what they need to do to deal with the obstructions and roll out the projects, if executive council minutes seem to be not sufficient, then take your executive council minutes to be further adopted by the assembly legislature, the assembly chamber, and take a firm position against the technocrats. That it is so it, it's not secretary this position or secretary that instruction. It is the assembly that have adopted and made a firm decision that this must be done, this must be done, this must be done. And the remedies you have to deal with that is to refer those public servants who are derelict in due to the Public Service Commission for disciplinary action. So there are remedies. So to hide behind excuses after giving commitment to say three and a half years was not enough, that excuse will fail. How do you respond to the view, because you, you're, you're relating a situation which, according to my research, many say seems very similar to what took place. Of course, some are probably too young to remember. But as for someone being in the politics, uh, some are saying these are the similar kinds of challenges that were faced after coming out of what might have been the Ho Chai Charles and others uh, uh, tenure for just to about 20 years or so before the transition to what would have been in 2001 the Orville London-led administration facing similar kinds of challenges. Um, are you saying, uh, what are your perspectives when you make the comparison? They start then with Orville London and probably the challenges faced by some of the same technical officers um, who might have been faithful to or thankful to, uh, you know, the former administration probably attempting to frustrate the efforts what are your thoughts when you make the comparison between this current administration startup now and the Orville London led administration startup then at that time the comparison really is this is a young energetic group of politicians that got a the full will of the people and so was over London. But when you look at the deliveries of the London administration, can one argue? And you know, that's a very interesting question. Eh? When you look at the deliveries, deliverables of the London administration, can it be argued that he was frustrated by the technocrats? In fact, some of, if not most of the technocrats who have raised political objection to the London administration. They have a bite of the cherry now. They are mostly in the executive council now. So ultimately, you see part of the challenge as dealing with uh, the issue where there might be technocrats within the system who are attempting to frustrate uh, or certainly contribute to challenging the progress uh, that the administration is attempting to make? Yes. Yes, I verily believe that. But I'm saying that will not work as an excuse for this executive, as much as people may know it. You see, because the reality is that politics is our people's business, is our people's lives, is our people's development, is our people's future, is our people's comfort, is our people generally. And so too much hope was invested in this administration. And on that basis, they will not be able to rely on the frustration of the technocrats. I think Would they you? are large in numbers and can sufficiently deal with that issue. 
Would you say there's a fear probably to take some of the, um, the decisive uh, decisions as it relates to uh, whether or not you have persons that can drive your mandate or that are indeed moving in that direction? And I make the comparison. It was uh, Dr. the Honorable Keith Rowley as Prime Minister that gave indications that once his um, administration was back in office that he would be making changes, for example, with the Ministry of Tobago Development uh, reverting and without hesitation, uh, he got into office and that was done. Um, would you say there's a fear on the part of this administration to probably take some of those more decisive actions, which may mean making some uh, major changes? And can that still be done two years in? It seems like he's uh, frozen there in terms of uh, we're not getting a, a clear connection but you know very interesting he's alluding to the fact that there they, they appears to be challenges coming out from um, in terms of technocrats and those within the system and you know the, the question I raised in relation to the Orville London led administration is because I feel like ultimately when you do your checks and you do your uh, research and so on um, I feel as though Orville London face similar challenges yes. um, at the start in 2001 because here it is if you know the politics any at all he came into a situation where it was felt that's right that the pnm would never <laughs> <laughs> sit right. in the seat of governance in tobago and he was able to lead the charge to bring that victory in 2001 after tobago for its entire period prior period would have been led um you know by others accordingly and therefore, ultimately, um, you know, he would have faced similar challenges. The question at this point is um, finding ways to be able That's to right. overcome. That's right. That's You've right. got to find ways to be able to overcome. Because really and truly, when I asked the question, and I know he, he, he probably understood it a little differently, and I take responsibility for that. But it was really that comparison with the startup period in 2001 mm -hmm. of the Orville London administration and the startup period now That's right. of the Farley Augustine led administration uh, in 20 uh, that started last year and how do you take ago. how do you take the reins how do you take the reins to, to overcome and to implement and to ensure the execution um so that you can keep you know <clears throat> you can keep the governance the way it's supposed to be led for as he said for the comfort of the people of tobago the people who elected you for this position how do you rein in the situation and ensure that you remain control you remain in control of it to ensure that you execute in a, in a way that is acceptable by the people because we, he's talking about people saying they're dissatisfied so how do you how do you overcome that challenge that was my you know my next question what do you do how do you approach the situation and how long is it going to take how soon do you rein in and ensure that you deliver um, what you promise to deliver to the because people uh, the, the reality is i am yet to see a politician that delivers on all the promises that you've oh. made. And it oh. doesn't matter where you sit. Uh, on the globe. You know, on the globe, in fact. Uh, so for me, we have a responsibility to hold them accountable to deliver most mm -hmm. in some way, form or fashion. That's right. And I feel as though, uh, ultimately as well, for some, like any new administration, the test of time for many is really looking at the next election to see if they are able to, to retain, to, to retain um, or if it is that there will be a reverting on the part of the, the people of Tobago and then we may begin to see some kind of a change and action again. People felt uh, that after 2001 with Orville London that it was going to be a one term, mm -hmm. right? And then he showed his, 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 his stability to be able to allow the organization and to allow uh, the, 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 the party to retain its status us and therefore continue in office for uh, 20 plus years sure. certainly making um you know commendations in that regard so it's really left to see and i feel that's the views of some mm -hmm. this is the first term yes they know that you can't fix everything but as, as skippy rightfully said they want to see some low-hanging fruit that's some right. things yeah, dealt with. something yeah. and certainly that's the responsibility of any administration in office um so it's going to be a very interesting time heading on in i feel like january is going to be the kicking off of um <laughs> Or, or not even kicking off it's going to be the continuation That's right. <laughs> of the campaign season I, i'm watching over the weekend and i'm seeing some of the events and happenings at the national level that's live and then i'm reminded oh yes julian it's actually a general election that's right, and a tobago house of election right. tobago house of assembly election that's side by side that's right that's um, right. flowing there in 2025 so interesting times ahead i don't know who do we have up next right. uh, in the lineup
right up next and in studio is Christopher Nathan. Christopher Nathan is up next. He is the CEO of Velvet International and the director of Making Style Program. He is up next, up next. And we're talking about updates for Miss Tobago 2024 beauty pageants. Certainly looking forward to uh, hearing all about that. All right, viewers, at this point, we want to remind you that this is your opportunity to share, share the live, share the live, share the live. Share the live.